every writer has definitely, no matter what their experience is, asked themselves and faced this question. What if my writing sucks? Now, it's that moment of doubt where you wonder, as the writer, if you're cut out for this at all. Can I be a writer? Can I have a career as a writer? Can I write in general? But here's the thing. Feeling like your writing isn't good enough is a normal part of the creative process. I've been there before myself. I'm just saying we all have those moments of doubt. But I still, I find uh, from time to time, I have to get out of that rut. And how do I do it? Well, today I want to show you what I do uh, to push through these moments of doubt, why they happen, and how to turn that negative energy into growth. And that's why today we're going to talk about what if my writing sucks, how to push through it, but why we feel, why we feel like our writing sucks. Well, you know, honestly, sure, sure, over criticism, comparisons to other writers, etc., etc., are the ever dreadful perfectionism is going to be the killer of motivation, right? Sometimes we're over criticizing our own work. Uh, anybody who says anything small, as far as like, you know, I wish, uh, wish there was a little bit more of this. We get a little like, what are you talking about, right? But we also compare ourselves to other writers often. And and sometimes, eh, I don't know about you, but I deal with perfectionism. It's something that happens. But those things have led, uh, basically led me to find hundreds of other things to do instead of working on my novel. I've organized and cleaned up my desk, swept, or did the dishes in place of writing a few times. Yeah, that's right. I say to myself, Am I even good? My writing sucks. Like, why am I even trying this? I'm nowhere as good as blank, 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 and blank, blank, blank. You know, you know what? Uh, before I write, uh, I'll straighten up my desk. Uh, you know, uh, there's some dishes I gotta do. Let me get some dishes going. And but trust me, I know that you know that I know that we've read successful author books and thought and compared them to our own writing. From my writing is better than this. To how am I going to compare to this? This is so good, and everything in between. How many times have you looked at a best-selling novel or a beautifully crafted scene and suddenly your draft feels like garbage? But what you're not seeing are the years of work that went into that final product. You're comparing your first draft to someone's polished version, to someone's rounds and rounds of cleanup, edits, alpha, and beta readers. That's true. Sometimes when we're looking at a book that's in the store, on the shelf, or on even in your bookshelf, those books have gone through countless hours of rewrites, countless hours of editing, and countless hours of alpha and beta readers. When you're working on your first draft or your zero draft, a second, third, or even a fourth draft, you got to remember you're still in the refining process, Okay. And that's why we're going to do a nice little walkthrough. And I'm going to show you my before and my after of a scene. All right. There's a little behind uh, behind the scenes. So, all right. First, listen, you got to accept that every draft starts rough. I mean, like rough. And as an example, let's pop my my scene onto the screen, as they say, right? Boom. Share me now. All right. As you can see, this is a very, very rough draft. This is what a, this is a, how would I say, um, a zero draft without my uh, bullet points. Normally, normally it would look like this. Boop. And have bullet points like that. But we're not going to do that today. Anyway. Uh, so I'm going to just kind of like read through it real quick, just to give you an example of what it reads like. And I think if you've watched other videos, I told you, sometimes I just start the sentence with their name, just so I know who's speaking devious. I was only gone for a few minutes. Yarzy. Yes. But a few minutes longer devious, right? I don't even go into tags or anything. I just get it out. Right. So here we go. <clears throat> devious. Here's a loud whistle. It sounds like the flaragus pelon bird. Now, uh, this is actually going to change. I've changed that. So, but I also try to add the uh, how I pronounce it uh, also as I'm writing. So, flar flargus, pelum, 
right? But I am I, I actually change. So that's interesting that you get to see where it started and where it goes. Um, and then it's the bird of Nodragas. Now, even Nodragas, the spelling of Nodragas has changed. Uh, and then, of course, I define, as you can see within my notes, I'm defining certain elements. So this is the Naradita tribe's traditional animal call. This call is specifically made to help locate them and call others to them. So that's some that has evolved too over the course of working on the book. Now, Devis, 12 years old, that has also changed, right? Because even the zero drafts, there's going to be a process of adjustment and uh, refinement. And that's the power of writing is that just because you wrote it down doesn't behold you to the information. You're allowed to grow and evolve, especially as you get further into your book and you redefine things or more importantly, you define them, right? You, you, uh, they solidify, right? Anyway, so Devious, 12 years old, climbs up his horse and heads towards the sound. Now, a couple things here. Uh, this is just sort of an idea of a scene, just where kind of where I want to start it. This is act one, by the way. So, so I'm like, where do I want to start the scene? Uh, what's some world building I want to drip into there? Right. And then uh, I need to know that Devious is 12 years old. Well, at this time, he's, he's a little older than that in the new in the revise. So he reaches Yarzi. So as you can see, there's, there's no real movement. It's just like, here's a beat. Now here's another beat. All right. And uh, let me fix that. Do, do. Just so it has a. All right. He reaches Yarzi. Yarzi is both the trainer of the children from the Naradita tribe and the war chief. Excellent. All right. Now, the reason I do this is because when I was working on it, I knew I knew that I needed Devious to have a trainer. Uh, I made up his name and then I wanted to find that he's more than just a trainer and that he actually has. That's his duty for all the children in Naradita, not just Devious and, of course, the war He's the war chief, right? Uh, which also changed. Uh, this is no longer relevant to the story, right? All right. He sits on top his horse. He blows out again through his covered mouth with both hands and flutters one hand on top of the other. The familiar bird call sounds again as Devious comes into view. Very simple, very straightforward. It's not a. Re it's first of all, it is not a refined pro. Lo let alone is there immersion. Let alone is their character, etc., etc. Devious. I was only gone for a few minutes. Yarzi, yes, but a few minutes longer than you should have been. A great leader also knows how to follow. Devious. Yes, Yarzi. So now we learn Yarzi's name, which means that I probably wouldn't show Yarzi's name right now while I write it, which you'll see. He follows at Yarzi's speed. The two horses walk uh, through the trail. You worry too much. Uh, yeah, you worry too much. Yarzi, we worry for those who, uh, uh, we worry for those we care about the most. And I care about your father enough to be worried. He'd kill me if anything were to happen to you. <laughs> All right. So I have to accept that this draft is literally the roughest version of it. Now I'm going to show you a refined version of that opening scene. So this is the this moment, this beat, and ha this was the original opening, and now I'm going to show you the new opening, okay? All right, here we go. Devious ran his fingers over the deep, jagged lines of a symbol claiming the area for forest trolls. He gauged its age by the dried sap running down the thick brown bark. The faint, sour smell of troll lingered on his fingers, emanating from the wound in the wood. Dovegdas, he muttered, trying not to dis disturb what could be listening. It's far too early in the season for markings this fresh, a truth that adjusted his knee on the thick black soil, his concern measuring the sediment. His gaze swept over the untouched trees, resting undisturbed by any warded rituals. The visual depth of the trees blurred over the black, uh, the backdrop of sounds morphing around him, claiming his alertness. Mid-afternoon whispers of forest life reminded him of Yarzi's lesson that silence equals danger. And the even hum of life created a texture beyond any silence to worry about. A gentle breath of wind reached the barbarian, its soft breeze rustling through his brown shoulder-length hair. There's a big difference between this and this. And there is a scene that comes directly after this. Um, 
where uh, I basically directly after this, he hears the sound, you know, the, the, uh, you know, it basically is like a high pitched call mimicking a flaragus pollen bird abruptly, abruptly snap devious from his calm respite. It ricocheted through the forest, stuttering like a stone across water. He glanced toward its source to hear another call that pushed through the trees, sending him into action. Right. And then basically I explain him getting all the way to Yarzi. Uh, and then, of course, here we go. I'll actually show this scene is a little bit, this beat comes a little bit later, but boop. all right. Da, 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 da. Let's go to 12. 12. All right. So there you go. So this is just the dialogue. So a variation on the dialogue that we read originally, which was this. I was only gone for a few minutes, right? So now I added the title of what a trainer is, right? So I was only gone for a few moments, my Verone. He said, his youthful voice evident in his defense. Yes, still a few moments longer than you should have been. The man turned to him. We must stay together for numbers protect the few. Yes, my of our own. He replied, his head falling as the words leaked out. My right to my right and a strong wall we will be. Right. So the dialogue is is a, is a much different. Right. And I expanded on this beat. So I expanded on this and this. And then this actually comes up a little bit later, but it's slightly different. But as you can see, there's always refinement and adding. And when you're looking at your first zero, your zero draft, your first draft, or even your second draft, allow it to suck. It's rough. It has no purpose other than to be rough. All right. Number two. Step two, you got to break the cycle of over editing. One of the biggest reasons writers feel stuck and thinking their writing sucks is because they over edit. They keep going back to fix the same paragraph instead of moving forward. Right. So a simple tip to remember is when you feel like something isn't working, take a break and come back to it later. Instead of putting all that time into trying to adjust it. Like when you're writing, just write, get it out, get the suck out. And then when you go back to do your work, that's when you can kind of play with it a little bit more. But if you're trying to find the right word or you're trying to make it seem perfect, stop. You're going to get back to it anyway. You got you to do more work later. Every draft is going to revise and revise and revise. But the, the goal is to keep moving forward, keep working on things. And, you know, if you have to adjust something, you know, two or three times, th th that's one thing. But if you're stuck on that one moment for 30 minutes to an hour, move over, move over, right? What I do for my zero drafts is just what you basically saw above. Uh, I write with train of thought. I get the ideas from my head to the page. If a note comes up or a new credit uh, or I create a new bit of information, uh, you'll see you saw what I did. I like to put it. I like to make it in red. I put it in brackets, parentheticals. Um, but the zero draft, OK, uh, is not for me to write the best pro I can. It's for me to get the story out of my head. When I get to the first draft, it's less about perfect prose and more about adding the story. Because remember, a narrative is made up of both plot and story. Plot is what needs to happen no matter what. And story is how the events unfold through the emotional experiences and choices of the characters. I say that often on the show. I really, I should really uh, make a shirt with that. Anyway, um, so my first draft start. Uh, my, my my zero draft is get out the plot and the ideas and you know that's where I'm discovering things because I have the outline and I'm following the outline but I'm just kind of like broadly and roughly mapping out chapters and scenes right but uh, my first draft is where I start adding the personality that's where I start creating more refined dialogue uh, where I create a little bit of behavior uh, where I challenge some of the choices that characters are making based on the needed plot uh, my second draft, however, is where I go and I do light cleaning so I can send it off to the alpha readers to give me feedback on practical elements of it. I won't have like a really clean draft until at least my fourth or fifth draft. And that's where editors come in, etc. cetera. Um, with that second draft, I make sure that the plot to me is strong. Uh, I make sure that the characters are on the page. But I don't care about spelling errors. I don't care about grammar. What I care about is that when the alpha readers are reading it, they could give me 
uh, feedback on the practical elements. Uh, you know, is the is the plot clear? Are the characters clear? Um, do things make sense? Uh, is there consistency? Is there growth? Are characters developing, or do they feel the same? Right. Um, but I, I have seen I have seen writers spend lots of money on editors on drafts like a first draft and then they spend money and they get it cleaned up and then they do a second draft and they go it's a lot of money to, to have somebody look at it like let's say you have like a ninety thousand word <clears throat> book and it's times let's say they're charging you seven cents per word right that's sixty three hundred dollars that's crazy all right anyway learn to embrace Critique, constructive, not destructive. All right. What that means is uh, basically, uh, you know, construct. Con well, let's go over. Okay. So uh, this one, this one is probably the hardest step. Let's be honest. Uh, learning to embrace critique. Another reason writers think their work sucks is fear of feedback. Criticism is hard, but constructive criticism, criticism is one of the best ways to improve. Instead of seeing feedback as a sign that you're not good enough. Look at it as a roadmap to make your writing better. Some feedback I give to my clients is that something is happening, but nothing is happening. All this means is that things are happening on the page. People are talking, moving around, they're eating. There's maybe a fight, but nothing is happening because it's not happening through the emotional experiences and choices of the characters. This feedback can be difficult to hear. Of course, stuff is happening on the page. It's all about taking a breath and observing the page from a distant perspective once you hear that nothing is happening. All right. Um, really quick. If you look at your page and you aren't challenging your characters, the characters are not making choices beyond the plot's demand, meaning like, well, they got on the horse. Getting on the horse is a choice. They got to get on the horse to, to leave the town. Uh, well, uh, they fought the guy. They chose to fight the guy. Uh, yeah, well, you know, in the Born Supremacy, uh, Matt Damon has to fight the guy because it's an action film and he has to stop the guy from following them. Right. The choices are how they react to um, uh, how they react emotionally to the fact that they did have to fight somebody, that they have to continue fighting somebody. Uh, maybe after the first fight and they see three more people going, they go, all right, you know what? Maybe I fight or I don't fight, but I got to find a way to get out of here, right? And then each choice, there's a difference between like, all right, uh, let's go and find the sword of power. That's not a choice. The choice is the discussion against the, the uh, positions being challenged, you know? Uh, we got to go find the sword of power. Uh, you mean the one that's uh, in mount to kill us? Yes. Uh, I'm. I don't think. I don't think that's the way to go. I think we need another solution. Um, no, no. The sword of power is the solution, and we have to go. All right. Well, then you're on your own with this because I'm not going to risk my life for something that uh, it's a 0.3 percent chance of us getting. And it's like, well, what else do, would you expect us to do if not go get the sword of power? We need the sword of power. Right. And now they're going back and they're discussing. It. I'm not saying I'm, I'm using this as a loose example, but that, that's where you're challenging positions. Right. And then maybe, maybe uh, the character that's like, we got to go get the sword of power and mount kill us. Right. Their position is we got to go. This is it. And the other one's like, I don't know if we should go. This is dangerous. But then the protagonist convinces the one who didn't want to go to go. The foil, one might say. When they get to Mount Kill, em, kill Us All, right? Uh, uh, while they're hunting down the sword, things happen, right? Like uh, they get in trouble or they almost die or whatever. And the original position of the protagonist is like, I think this is a bad idea. And then maybe the position of the person who didn't want to go is like, we're already here. We're halfway through. We might as well see it through. And now the protagonist has doubts. And the other person doesn't. And that's an example of challenging, changing positions. And that's story. Like you're seeing people move and evolve and, uh, you know, you're deconstructing them on the page ultimately. But, you know, we got to go get the sword. I think that's a great idea. Let's go get the sword. We're at Mount Kill them All. Oh, there's bad guys. Let's fight the bad guys. We won. We killed the bad guys. Let's continue down. Oh, danger. 
oh, there's a boulder coming. Let's run because we have to. It's not really a choice. You know, we could either die or run. We're running. All right, we got we got out of there. Okay, great. Um, all right, now we got to go through. We, we, there's three doors. Oh, they're about to make a choice because there's three doors. Uh, let's pick that door. Excellent. Oh, that's the right. That's the correct door. I have found the sword of power. There's no choices there. It's just plot is dictating it. Now, in that situation, if I really wanted to go crazy, one of those doors they choose ends up being the wrong choice. And now they have to make choices to fix the issue. And that becomes story. Anyway, with that said, when it comes to critiquing and you hear somebody say something's not working on the page or stuff is happening, but nothing is happening or whatever the case, it's about really listening. You don't have to change anything. Like if they're like, this character is boring and you think that character is great, you don't have to change anything. You could be like, thank you, but be nice. Just listen, because there might be a nugget of something in there that will help influence the way you look at the story the next time you work on the edits or the next time you write. Now, I've personally gotten feedback where someone told me that the soldiers fighting this group of people are either crazy soldiers or stupid soldiers because they're not reacting to how many of their people are being killed. And you know what? Once I truly listened, they were right. And it led to a really great world and character moment. It turned the scene into a realistic fantasy novel moment. I was able to reevaluate not only the critique, but add a moment, a beat within the scene or scenes that allowed that to be represented and challenge the situation. The soldiers of the antagonistic force were like, what are we doing? This is crazy. We're not going in anymore. And their leaders are like, you have to go. And they're like, no. Right? And there's like a back and forth. And then uh, the leaders are like, hey, they do something. And then the soldiers are like, all right, uh, I think it's I think it's better we go. We, we continue to try. The things are challenged. You see it on the screen, right? So when it comes uh, when it comes to critique, uh, comes to a critique, there is a best worst scenario. Best case, they're pointing out something you didn't notice because you're emotionally invested in the manuscript and have a biased understanding of the information that the readers wouldn't have. You know everything, where it's going, why it's doing it. You, you have a deep... Uh, uh, intimate relationship with those characters, uh, these characters in the world. But the worst case scenario is uh, you need to do work and change things up. You got, you, you're going to have to say, all right, something is not working. And I'll be honest, critiques are just words and they're not being said as a way to offend or hurt your feelings. At the end of the day, you don't even have to listen to it. You can nod and say thank you and then leave the pages alone. What I'd say is to listen, observe, and think about it in a way that allows you to make an informed decision on something that means the world to you. I'm just saying. All right. If you haven't done so already, uh, please subscribe. Hit the bell icon. Exercise. So this is something you can do on your own. So uh, this is a quick exercise to help you push through that my writing sucks moments uh, that us writers deal with. Step one, take a glance at your own writing. You know, go and find a scene that you wrote in your novel. All right. If you're not writing a scene or a novel uh, and you're just trying to get over the hump of like, well, I, I suck as a writer, so I don't even want to write. Then try just writing a short passage or two, write two passages about your day as it as if told to the uh, through the POV of your emotional experience. So, again, first step is. Uh, you're going to look at a piece of writing that you've done. Now, if you don't have writing, just write a passage or two of your emotional experience of your day through your POV. Right? You could write in first person, third person limited. You could even write in third person omniscient. Hell, you could write in second person if you're willing to do it. You walk down the stairs and embrace the warmth of the sun upon your sleepy face. All right. So now it's time to be good to yourself and find the good. Step two is where you're going to read through what you've written and identify three things you like about it. Uh, these can be uh, big or small items. Maybe you use the word that fits perfectly. Perhaps you describe something in a vivid way, or it could be as simple as I completed the task. Tom asked me to do this and I did it because honestly, writing is freaking hard. And uh, to get anything down on the page is an accomplishment. Writing is like, all right, 
you probably heard me say writing is easy. Writing is easy. Like just writing is easy. Like the cat smells. Uh, today I walked into my room and I saw my sister doing blank, blank, blank. Writing is easy. Just getting it out is easy. Like, but the craft of writing is hard. Do you know what I'm saying? Plus having the will to write is probably the hardest. Starting, starting is definitely not hardest. But, uh, this is the step where you got to say to yourself, what do I like about my writing? So first of all, you got it out. You wrote it. You know, but more importantly, once you've identified these three positive aspects, write what it was that you liked about it. So if you discover a word that you like, like, for example, you know, it fits perfectly. Like, why does it fit perfectly? What is it about that sentence or that word or that phrasing or that immersion? Um, like I get a lot of compliments about a line about, uh, you know, coins falling on the table and moving, uh, scurrying across like a, a collection of uh, metallic bugs or something like that or metallic beetles and uh, uh you know sometimes sometimes you, you you hit a gem all right number three identify an area for improvement now basically you got to say to yourself all right now that i identified the bed let's let's take a look right so choose one specific thing you'd like to improve in your writing this is the hard part because you gotta uh take accountability admit to yourself this is the part where you have to ultimately sit back and say, is this good or bad? I think this is bad. What do I need to do? So instead of looking at it and making a blank statement like, make it better, or try something like, vary my sentence structure, or add more sensory details. These slight adjustments or observations really help with eyeing the potential of improvement. So when you're looking at something, if you're just like, all right, I need to work on this part, it's not specific. But if you say, well, what is it that needs work? What is it missing? What is it lacking? Does it feel abrupt? Does it feel too fast? Does it feel too much? Like, am I, is the pace so slow because it's just filled with detail and like bogged down with descriptive uh, elements? Um, does it feel expositiony? Does, uh, do I like the word choices? Am I, you know, whatever the case may be, right? Try to figure out what it is and then write down why it's not working. OK, but ultimately, this exercise helps you balance self-criticism with self-appreciation. It's important to recognize areas where you can grow, but it's equally crucial to acknowledge what you're doing well. I don't know about you, but like if somebody gives me notes back, the thing that hits me the hardest is what's not working. And I had to learn and train myself to be like, wait a minute, this is this is just as the bad is just as valid as the good. But you get good and you're just like, oh, yeah, of course it's good, right? And then, like, you get that bad and you're like, ah, right? And you get all, right? So you got to you gotta learn to appreciate both, right? And and you don't you do have to say to yourself, you know what? I did a good job with this. This thing is good. Um, I have a writer friend that's uh, amazing at world building and really good at action. Some of the some of the dialogue needs a lot of work. And occasionally, occasionally plot elements are a little missed. <clears throat> but their strengths, where their strengths lie, like even their atmospheric writing is really good. <clears throat> but does that mean because they can't do, they're not, they're not, they still need work on the other areas that those elements of atmosphere and world building and action make their writing not good because it's not all good. We're never, ever going to be great at everything. We're going to be really good at some things, sometimes just one thing maybe two or three things. We're going to be good at other things. And then there's going to go to reverse some things, maybe one or two things we're really terrible at. And then some things we're all kind of, and you have to work on those things. And a lot of times I tell people don't only practice when you write, meaning like, well, I'm writing a book, so I'll practice. No, take, take a scene. Think about your day, write out your day. Think about an immersive element. What are other ways you can uh, describe the way something tastes or feels or see or the way you see something, right? So it's okay to just practice these things. Like when I was uh, il an illustrator back in my youth, um, I would draw eyes all day, just eyes, a pair of eyes, a single eye, the left eye, the right eye, uh, not left eye as in like, you know, <laughs> don't go chasing waterfalls, just stick to the river. Okay, I'm old. Um Anyway, I would practice, you know, because I wanted to learn to get better. And then I would practice arms. I would practice positions. Uh, not position, but, you know, like the way they would look like, right? Because I wanted to draw comic books. So, like, it's about three-dimensional. Like, getting the hand like this, 
right? Like, where do I want it? Do I want it? Is this saying something right there? Okay, boom, this is saying something. Maybe it's, uh, maybe I could do this, right? Like, so you learn to like move things around and that's the same thing with writing. You got to learn to play with the words and have control over it. Sometimes you got to write, uh, you know, a very specific thing, like practice dialogue and I like, I, I need to get better at my eyes. So that would be dialogue, right? So let me just write dialogue. Let me write funny dialogue. Let me write serious dialogue, right? And that's another thing. Everything is broken down. There's funny dialogue, serious dialogue. There's subtext dialogue. There's uh, context dialogue. There's exposition dialogue, right? All those things have an element of need for practice. All right, final thoughts. This is a really quick final thought. Uh, look, feeling like your writing sucks isn't a sign of failure, okay? It's a sign of growth. The fact that you're questioning your work means you care enough to make it better. Remember, every writer you admire has been where you are now. They've all started and stared at, well, I should say, they've all started where you are, uh, and they've stared at words and wondered if they were even good enough. <clears throat> the difference is they kept going. They pushed through the doubt. They revised. They learned and they grew. So the next time you feel stuck or discouraged, remind yourself this is part of the process. It's not a roadblock. It's a stepping stone. Your awareness of areas for improvement is a tool, not a hindrance. Use it to fuel your growth, not to hold yourself back. You got to keep writing, keep revising, and keep believing in your stories, okay? With each word you write, you're not just creating a piece of work, you're crafting your skills as a writer. And that journey, with all its ups and downs, is what makes the final product so rewarding. Your future self will thank you for pushing through these moments of doubt. Because one day, you'll look back at your work uh, that you once thought sucked, and you'll see it for what it truly was, a crucial step in your evolution as a writer. Because what sucked then is not what's going to suck today, especially if you put the work in. So pick up that pen, open that laptop, hit that uh, typewriter, <clears throat> okay? and keep going. Your best writing is still ahead of you, and the only way to get there is to keep moving forward one word at a time. Because as we say, writing is a multi-stage process. Your first draft, second draft, and final product will all look different. Just like the example I showed you, my zero draft looked much different than that other draft, right? Which was uh, the fourth draft. So, uh, all great writers, this is very important. I say it often. All great writing is rewriting, and all great writers have great editors. All right. <clears throat> Next video in the series. Uh, the writing advice uh, episode will be about the pros and cons of writing under a pen name. So that is some advice for you, right? If you haven't done so already and you like what you saw today, please uh, subscribe and hit the bell icon. Uh, you know, and if you found uh, the information today helpful, uh, give me a thumbs up. Uh, you know, it uh, really helps the chat. So anyway. All right, that was actually, uh, we, did, we did good. We got through that, right? So, as always, peace and harmony, truth in action, and keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Bye!